So we heard this morning uh, two excellent series of talks and discussion of an overview of the different geologic environments of lithium brines, their association with lithium sources, and the opportunities and challenges with extracting the lithium and the resource sustainability. So it's a real pleasure to introduce this next se session, which is going to focus on the methods, environmental impact, and the economics of mineral extraction from brines. I do have a couple of reminders uh, that you can, to the audience, you can submit questions to the panelists on our webpage in live stream. Look for the Slido box underneath the live stream video. And then to those uh, who are here um, it, it, or, or online, uh, when you do have a question, you speak, please say your first name uh, and you know to avoid acronyms. So our, our first speaker is Tom Lagrasso. He's the director of the Critical Minerals Institute. Welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I want to um, provide an overview of the various technologies needed to extract lithium from these sources that we've talked about today. Uh, thank the other speakers for laying out the variety of different sources, the different chemistries, and some of the attributes of those sources, high temperature, low temperature, because all of that comes into play when we evaluate technologies that can be used to extract lithium. Um, I am the, uh, at the Ames National Laboratory. We manage the critical mission hub. And I just wanted to give a little context uh, um, to understand the direction that I come from. And that is that CMI develops technologies as part of an in innovation pipeline to be able to address the technical challenges associated with change that are necessary for clean energy technologies, and most importantly, to de-risk those technologies, have a pathway to commercialization. We do early stage research, so um, our three focus areas are to enhance and diversify supply. Obviously, that's the topic for today, but we also consider developing substitutes and applying circular economy principles to the recovery um, and um, uh, production of materials that contain critical elements. We are a public-private consortium uh, of uh, nine national laboratories, 20 universities, and 36 industry partners um, working across the various stages of the supply chain. All right, um, we've heard a lot of different um, attributes of these sources. And I guess I'm, I'm happy to say that there are a number of technologies that are that can be utilized to extract lithium. I've shown five here. These are kind of the leading um, uh, sources of extraction technologies, absorption, ion exchange, solvent extraction, membrane extraction, and electrochemical. Each of these have its own uh, positives and negatives, and a lot of times the choice of which of these technologies to be to utilize comes back to what's the source. Not just what is the lithium chemistry, but what's the other chemistry? Um, shown in these illustrations, we have uh, potassium and calcium and chlorine and sodium, which is common to almost every source. So obviously we want to be selective. We only really want to grab the lithium um, and leave everything else behind. But there are other elements in these streams, in these feedstocks, um, and we've heard about them, manganese, zinc. Um, some are perhaps valor, uh, you can get value out of them. Some are deleterious. And so we have to choose our technologies accordingly. Um, to illustrate that is um, dominant here, we can look at how these technologies are being actually deployed. Here um, is kind of the stage of development of these technologies as they apply to direct lithium extraction uh, for various types of sources. But on the left, it goes from lab scale to piloting to demo and to commercial. And across the bottom, they are the five leading technologies. And you can see that various companies are at various stages, um, both public as well as 
private investments in these technologies. Um, what is apparent from this grouping is that absorption and ion exchange typically um, show the greatest um, uh, applicability to, to these dilute sources that are, are associated with brine. I'm going to just choose this one example as an illustration of kind of some of the factors that um, come into play. Um, and this is lithium extraction and conversion from geothermal brine. This was a, a part of a GTO study. The report was put, but it's illustrative without getting into all the details of a, an actual. But basically the brine comes in and one has to first of all think about silica removal. And or silica management for that matter, because it's not just removal from the stream. It's what do you do with it once you, you have it separated. And so you think about co uh, byproducts, colloidal silica or iron compounds. Last thing you want to do is obviously create an iron silicate that needs to be disposed of. Um, the, the key there, uh, next step in the center is the improved um, lithium sorbents. This would be uh, to develop um, directly out of a chloride solution that uh, concentrate, uh, to A, concentrate it and then convert it into a refined product. That could be lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate, depending on uh, what downstream activity you're going to feel um, the offtake product will be uh, sold into. In addition to extracting the lithium, you are left with zinc and manganese, and you can go through the precipitation process. Um, we heard earlier that zinc was a pilot plant, was, um, uh, was developed, um, and then ultimately um, uh, put aside uh, due to other factors like economics. Um, but now, yeah, we have uh, the valorization of these other materials that are contained in, in the stream. And then finally, um, the, obviously, the, the end product needs to be injected back into the well. Um, potentially, there could be potassium recovery um, if that's viable. So CMI has worked on um, sorbents. Um, we felt that the sorbent technology had the most versatility and broad applicability. And, um, and we've developed new sorbents um, that are based on lithium, uh, double hydroxide. Uh, and um, these have proved to be very effective, very selective in pulling lithium away or out of solution um, and leaving the sodium and potassium behind. Um, they were developed really to focus on geothermal brines, um, but we have also found them to be very applicable to, to the low temperature brines as well as um, oil and gas production uh, or oil and gas produced waters. Um, generally, sorbents are targeted for low concentrations um, and um, we can recover over 91% of the lithium chloride from geothermal brines. Um, that produces an alu, uh, a leachate that ultimately needs to be concentrated. We've combined um, the sorbent technology with forward osmosis membrane technology that concentrates it further from a 3% lithium chloride solution uh, to about 20%. And from there, then we can go ahead and use the lithium carbonate or take it even further and do lithium hydroxide production. Um, one of the important aspects to developing technology like this is to understand the environmental impacts. Um, we are replacing the technology um, or we want to compare this technology versus others. And so we've done quite a bit. It's kind of part of CMI to understand both the techno-economic and the life cycle analysis uh, aspects. And so, um, uh, you know, if we produce lithium carbonate from these geothermal brines using sorption and forward osmosis, we find um, from these analysis that the carbon footprint is 34% lower than um, production in salt flats and 26% lower than um, from 
uh, hard rock mining uh, of the mineral spodumene. Likewise, lithium hydroxide can also see some reductions, not as broad, but certainly on the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, we believe this technology achieves 48% reduction. Um, so when it comes to kind of what are our challenges um, for any of these five technologies that I listed, it's really improved selectivity. We want to be able to get the lithium, get it quick, um, the lowest number of stages, and certain technologies um, are better at that, more efficient. Um, but further R&D investments in efficient extractions, concentrations, and purifications are needed. Oh, I have them all out of order. Sorry, okay. Well, we need to integrate the DLE process from brines to batteries. Um, and, and, and industries have demonstrated individual individually in several steps. Um, water management, we've heard this before. So thank you earlier speakers for uh, introducing this issue. Water management is huge. Um, we have to have access to clean water for the delithiation process at the site and hence water consumption is a great concern. Sustainability of, of uh, direct lithium extraction over conventional lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide production methods. We've done some on our sorbent development, but I think we do need to understand if we're going to bring in a solvent extraction circuit, are we gaining anything? What are we gaining and to what degree um, perhaps over our existing production methods? Um, we can do that through life cycle assessments. We have to understand waste stream generations and any public health effects. I think there's, yeah, okay. Finally, um, co-valorization. Um, there's lots of byproducts, um, but lots of potential critical materials, as Scott pointed out. Um, what can we valorize? And uh, the, the opposite of this is which are the deleterious elements we have to deal with. And ultimately, to integrate the, any of these processes, pre-pilot scale demonstrations are needed, um, whether they're new absorbents or ion exchange uh, methods. So with that, I think that's it. Happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, about three. So if you want to stay at the podium. Yeah, I'm going to start with one that's online. Um, you've spoken a bit to how these technologies can be applied to the, the various lithium source sources of brines. Um, but could you say any more about that if you'd like, or are there certain deposits where they just probably not very um, appropriate? Well, there are many factors that come into play to determine whether a technology is going to be appropriate. The sorbents that we've developed in CMI certainly are low temperature sorbents. They are being tested for geothermal brines, um, but a lot of that has to do with thermal degradation that occurs over time and whether or not that sorbent technology will, will be applicable. So I think it one has to evaluate the appropriateness of any given technology in the context of, of the source, the impurities, um, and the uh, production parameters, such as temperature. Uh, Leanne? Oh, did it again. <laughs> um, so I'm really curious, you, you had on one of your slides a 91% reduction in environmental impacts compared to solar brines. And I'm um, wondering sort of, well, one, is that information public or, or, you know, in the studies? And so, you know, one, um, what environmental impacts does that include and at what scale? So the studies are, have been published and we can get those um, circulated, the citations. Um, Generally, the life cycle analysis impact factors um, are, are uh, about uh, 10 to 12 that are utilized. Um, boy, don't have a list in my head, That's but okay. it, it, greenhouse it, it, gas yeah. emission, it, eutrophication, um, but there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a typical, standard well, sort of life yeah. cycle analysis. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, done at scale. So we try to do that as best we can. Obviously, we're developing early stage technology um, and we can compare it to production 
to to technology that is at scale commercial production. But our production, um, we have to make assumptions about what that might scale. And so we do have to um, take that into account. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We only have time for one more questions, but they're popping in like crazy. <laughs> so I think I'll ask you, um, where does the norm, radium and uranium, et cetera, uh, end up in the process? Yeah, I, um, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I think it, the, the work that's been done so far has not fully addressed that um, for the sources that we've looked at. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't recall any of the the project team's research results addressing the rad materials. Thank you again, and um, if there's time later, we can have a discussion. Some of these other questions. All right, our our next speaker is Sophie Park Parker. And she is the Director of Science for Climate and Land Use in the California. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we have reached uh, critical post-lunch sleepiness. So I will try to keep us on task here. My name is Sophie, I'm from the Nature Conservancy. I'm here to represent biodiversity conservation and planning and talk about the potential impacts of proposed lithium extraction on those things in the contiguous United States. And everything I'm going to present today is based on three different studies, two reports, one peer-reviewed journal article, they're scienceforconservation.org. And this was the effort of several scientists at the Nature Conservancy, both within my chapter in California and in nine other chapters across the US. So for some context here, we're in the middle of this massive energy transition and thinking about how to address that informs why the Nature Conservancy is involved in this topic. Whenever there's any big change that's going to occur, there's the potential for environmental impacts. And so that's why we care. When there is uncertainty on a topic, when there are things that we don't know, that uncertainty presents risk. And so as far as thinking about how could lithium extraction as an activity affect biodiversity in the United States, our first task was to try and reduce that level of uncertainty. So the environmental impacts of lithium extraction can depend on several factors. We have extraction method, and that can be, as we've talked about, evaporative concentration or direct lithium extraction. We have the te different technologies that could be used that Tom was just highlighting. We have the scale of production. How large is this extraction site? And then what I'm going to focus on today are specific ecological conditions, and there are also hydrological conditions that um, can impact how much um, extraction uh, could impact environment, the environment. So there are many potential pathways for environmental impacts due to lithium. And here's a conceptual model to begin to think about those. So over on the left, you have the blue box and the different technologies for extraction of brines. And then you can follow those black arrows, which lead to different potential environmental impacts. Wherever there's industry or development, you have the potential for disturbance of soils and vegetation. You have the potential for pollution of air and water, and you have the potential for consumption of fresh water. And then if you continue to follow those black arrows, you can see the, how those environmental impacts could lead to impacts on specific groups of organisms plants, terrestrial organisms, and aquatic organisms. And critically, there are also ecological impacts of how those organisms interact with each other that we need to consider. So by the complexity of the, the number of black arrows on this diagram, you can see that this is already a very complex topic. So in order to try to dig into this, what we did was a simple overlay anal analysis. So we began by looking at where there are brine resources in the United States, and we talked to experts 
and we did internet-based searches to find where there's industry interest in developing those resources. We, we found that there were locations for 72 proposed lithium projects across the United States, and 57 of, seven of them involved brines. Now, of course, there are probably a lot more now as this study was done in um, 2022. If we zoom in a bit here, just looking at California and Nevada, each of those potential project sites is shown in the red on top of this pink overlay here. Um, and the centroid of each project is shown in with the darker red circle. And zooming in a bit finer here for a specific site, here's Panamint Valley in the California desert. The actual mine claim is shown by the solid line. And we added a two mile buffer around each site to cap cap capture the fact that there are some impacts that could be felt beyond the mine claim itself. Imagine fugitive dust or imagine the drawdown of groundwater that extends beyond the claim boundary. So then we, now that we have this information about each site, what we did is to layer on top of that existing data sets related to biodiversity conservation. These come in different categories. We have species and natural communities, conservation value, habitat, and land management designations. And what I'm showing you here is a very truncated list of the total number of data sets that we use. The complete table is about 10 pages long. But the ones that I'm going to talk about today and show you maps of include species, uh, citizen science species occurrence data, the Nature Conservancy's data layers, desert tortoise habitat, and national parks. So here's what these look like at our example project site. Now, if you can see in this map for species and natural communities category, the citizen science species occurrence data are shown by the orange stipple across this site. So this is an example of people going into the field, capturing information about the organisms that they find on the ground and entering it into a publicly accessible citizen science database like iNaturalist or eBird. The Nature Conservancy has developed on an eco-regional basis a number of different data sets that show how we can focus on protecting biodiversity across the United States and around the world. These polygons are based on vegetation types, intactness of habitat, and the potential to support biodiversity. So that's what that looks like at this project site. Additionally, we have what are called recognized biodiversity data layers, and you can see how that those data differ from the previous layer in terms of where they're showing up at this project site. There are mapped habitat polygons for special status species, in this case, the desert tortoise, which is federally listed as threatened, that occur within several of these lithium extraction sites. You can see the little orange square near the top of the claim area. Um, additionally, there's some additional areas within this project boundary that are um, mapped as desert tortoise habitat. And importantly, there are land management designations, particularly on public lands that can impact how those lands are managed for biodiversity. There are some lands that have a, have, have a very high level of management, such as wilderness and national parks, and other lands that have more of a public use mandate. So here you can see the green portion of the map is National Park Service land, in this case, Death Valley National Park. It's peeking in to the two mile context for this project site. So those are some examples in a mapped form. We can also look at these data in a tabular form. In this case, in California, we have the species that are federally and state listed on the left-hand side of the table. And on the right, we have where they're recorded for 15 different lithium extraction sites, potential lithium extraction sites. The ones that are grayed out are ones that don't have to do with brines. The ones that are in white are ones that contain brines. And what you can see from this is that there are many cases where there are listed species that have been mapped within the sites for proposed lithium extraction. We can look at the same sorts of data for conservation value, habitat, and management. 
And our main, main find, major findings here are that hundreds of species have been observed with, within our 57 sites for lithium extraction from brine. 204 are rare special status and or state tracked species. Three are federally endangered. One is a federally threatened species. 51 are state listed as endangered, threatened, or special status. And the rest of the 204 are listed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as near threatened, vulnerable, or endangered species. And there is taxonomic bias within the field of data collection. Uh, birds are the most recorded taxonomic group and appeared across the broadest geographic range of sites. And wetlands were the most common mapped habitat type. So in conclusion, I have some thoughts, uh, recommendations, and points that hopefully generate discussion here. Potential environmental impacts of lithium extraction from brine vary from site to site. It's not the same at every site. More field-based studies at proposed extraction sites are needed to understand the biology and the hydrology well enough to quantify those impacts. Our study is just a very high-level basic overlay analysis. We need more data. All methods of extraction from brine could impact wetlands, freshwater and groundwater dependent species and ecosystems. Those groundwater impacts are site specific, complex, and where groundwater is very old and is not being replenished quickly, those impacts could be irreparable. So think about springs in the desert. If those springs dry up, there's no place for organisms to go and hang out while they wait for the water to come back. Cumulative impacts analyses focused on wetlands are necessary. There are many places in the United States where there are migratory species that use not just one wetland, but multiple wetland systems. And so being able to understand the potential impacts across the region and even at a continental scale is important. Here's this life cycle analysis again. I'm using it in a different way here. Thinking about production, life cycle analyses are necessary for understanding impacts, not just extraction, but full the full um, suite of different activities that occur with production of lithium. It's important to understand all of them. And finally, with enough information, employing a smart from the start approach is possible. That means that we have the ability, because we have so many different places where this extraction activity could occur, we can start by focusing on places that potentially have the lowest impacts first. And I'll stop there and can take any questions. Thank you. Do we have time for two or three questions? So if you'd stay at the podium, please. Um, I'll start with one that we have from online. So you've spoken to the very large differences in potential environmental, including biodiversity impacts um, among sites. So what would you think would be the greatest uncertainties uh, in determining these impacts of brine extraction at a particular location? Maybe this one from the short and longer term perspective. <sighs> There are many places that have not been well botanized, um, where field surveys simply have not been done. Um, and so collecting more information on the ground is truly necessary in order to understand impacts for species. Uh, we need to be able to fill up our, our databases with information in order to make predictions about what could happen to species. Um, we may have a sense of where a species is located in a broader region, but when it comes down to site specificity, that on the ground information is at a, I mean, absolutely critical. Um, and then how did you determine the two mile buffer around the Panamint Valley project? Ah, yes, that's a art, isn't it? Um, it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, there are, there's no perfect way to make a buffer. And this is one that we, we commonly use in conservation planning. Leanne? Thanks, Sophie. Um, I was curious if you could just comment um, briefly about the criteria used to identify 57 brine projects. Yes. So what we did is we found all of the places that we could across the United States where there was a expressed interest in developing lithium resources. And some of those were hard rock and clay, and some of those were had a brine 
um, component. And so I just took the list and took off the ones that were the hard rock and clay and the remainder were those 57. I think there are far more than that. Those are the ones that we were, were able to find with our research at that time. Okay, so yeah, I guess I'm wondering um, what sort of verification process, um, or is it just if you found information that maybe like a junior exploration company was interested in brine, but maybe hadn't actually found brine? It runs the gamut. Okay. Yeah, some, some of these are, it's from claims databases at the state level. It's from websites from particular extraction companies in the mining industry. That's from um, your own uh, feedback that we we talked to you and other experts about where they knew there was industry interest. So it's a variety of different sources. Okay, and can I do a follow? Or no? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Oh, we have what time for one more question. I'd like to pick up Alex's question. That's okay. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. Um, to what extent um, have you and other environmental groups been working with state and federal regulators to try to figure out best practices for permitting? I mean, presumably a lot more work needs to be done since it's at an early stage, but you can talk about that, that'd be great. Yes, all the time. So we do our work at the Nature Conservancy in collaboration with whomever will work with us, with industry, with the regulatory agencies, with academic scientists. We're in um, constant contact and good communication with Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife, all of those agencies. So it's a big part of what we do. Yeah. Thank you again, Sophie. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> protocol changes. Um, so I want to remind the audience that you can submit questions to the panelists on our website uh, li uh, webpage live stream. Look for the Slido box underneath the live stream video. Okay, so our final speaker uh, is Simon, well, final, final of this session, <laughs> Simon Joet. Uh, Simon is a tenured director of the Ralph J. Roberts Center for for research in economic geology and the Arthur Brandt Chair of Exploration and Geology at the University of Nevada, Reno. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap up this session by uh, talking a bit about the economics of brine resources and, and continuing on a kind of thing that Sophie started by talking about uncertainty in the, the brine and specifically the lithium from brine or lithium sector in general. Um, we know we've heard already that a number of different minerals and metals can be extracted from brines. These include boron, sodium carbonate. The, you know, I've got a list on there, but uh, basically, the, as we've heard a lot about today, the majority of current R&D is focused on lithium, and that's likely to see the largest growth over the next few decades with significant amount of investment taking place in this area already. And so I am going to be focusing on lithium mineral economics, uh, talking a bit about supply and demand balance, price variations, and the likely impact this is going to have on, on lithium brine project development. Um, we know that the lithium market is complex. I think Scott touched up on that a, a little bit earlier. And the majority of lithium that's produced is actually sold via offtake agreements. So lithium producers have direct agreements with a lithium uh, user, like a, a battery EV manufacturer and so, uh, so on, rather than on the open market. And that appears to provide some security for individual operators against volatile lithium prices. If you've looked at the lithium price over the last couple of years, you know it's kind of going all over the place. The question is, you know, this is hedging against that price volatility. It's providing a bit of a reassurance, but the question is how robust. And what we need to think about, we're talking about all these potential developments in terms of lithium extraction. What we need to think about is the timing of that demand increase that we're seeing for lithium versus supply increase. Are these matched or are they offset? What implications does that have for essentially the lithium market and the, the stability of lithium producers? We know that drivers of demand includes increases in lithium ion battery production, but there's also policy drivers. If you look at the change in uh, tax breaks for electric vehicles that drove demand up for lithium to end 2022, and then we had a lithium price crash because of the change in demand for lithium as a result of those changes in, in policy. So this time, and the other thing to think about in all of this is the timescales of permitting and development versus demand increases. So the, there's a whole load of uncertainty on this balance of supply and demand that we need to think about in terms of its impact on the development of brine projects, specifically for lithium in this case, but you could apply this to, to any kind of brine extraction uh, 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 project. 
Um, one example is, uh, you know, we, in terms of offtakes, we've seen offtakes in agreements uh, from California, from the Salton Sea projects. There's multiple offtake agreements and clay and brine deposits in Nevada. Uh, one example of this is, uh, uh, I think actually Scott mentioned Compass Minerals trying to devour lithium as a byproduct of mag magnesium chloride production from the Great Salt Lake. They had an offtake agreement in place, but basically that project was scrapped in 2024 as a result of technical challenges, which means that that lithium is, is not going to be produced. So this indicates that even with these offtake agreements, which might provide a bit of reassurance, price volatility, technical challenges can have more significant issues. And there's other factors like uh, California has actually brought in a tax on the uh, lithium carbonate production, uh, $400 to $800 per tonne of lithium carbonate production from 2022 onwards. That scales on production. And also that, you know, if you compare, for example, California to Nevada, where we don't have such a tax, that may actually create a, a, bit, of a, 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 a bit of a difference in terms of where you might actually see brine projects developing versus brine projects having more challenging economics. This is uh, what's happened in the lithium price uh, from 2017 through to more or less the present day. You can see uh, this is a, essentially a, a spot price for lithium. Uh, I haven't got the actual kind of values on there, but what I've done is I've normalized the price to uh, 10th of May 2017. So in other words, that kind of getting up to five means that lithium between, say, 2022, mid-2022 and, and 2017 went up five times. We're back down to approximately the same level as we are in 2017. The thing to think about here is that this volatility we're seeing over the last couple of years, we need to compare to the time taken it, time in we need to actually develop a given project. Lithium extraction projects may take five to 10 years. You know, this graph goes from 2017 through to 2024. So this is probably on the order of time scale, the development of a lithium brine extraction project. The question is how can lithium brine extraction projects or any brine extraction projects deal with this type of volatility and uncertainty? If we, these are, uh, there's a bit of a, 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 some interesting data on here. What we've got is essentially a, a, a price variations shown in that kind of yellow color, lithium production, lithium reserves from the USGS. So we can see that lithium reserves and, 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 and production are actually in, increasing kind of systematically over the time. And what we've got there is a ratio. And that ratio just shows the ratio of essentially uh, reserves to production, or in other words, how much annual production divided by total estimated reserves globally. And that kind of indicates that the amount of lithium we've got in the ground relative to the amount we're producing is somewhat decreasing, at least in some estimates. So that means that we, we may have a, a bit of a, a problem in terms of lithium supply, but there are an awful lot of other considerations to think about that I'll kind of summarize. If we think about demand into the future, uh, estimates suggest that we might have a, a you know, a, by 2030, we might need 400,000 metric tons of lithium carbonate equivalent or about 80,000 metric tons of lithium metal. Demand here in the US, uh, mainly for electric vehicle batteries, that's equivalent to about 700 gigawatt per hour lithium ion battery capacity. Currently, as uh, other uh, speakers have shown, we produce about 5,000 metric tons of lithium carbonate or about 1,000 metric tons of lithium metal, uh, almost all from a Silver Peak brine operation in Nevada. But the thing to think about is that we're likely to see a significant ramp up of lithium production in the US. If you look at Nevada alone, we're going to produce, hopefully, maybe about 136,000 lithium, uh, lithium carbonate equivalent tons per year, mainly from non-brine sources. Thacker Pass, Rhyolite Ridge, Silver Peak is actually expanding its operations and trying to double production. Uh, we estimate we're going to see a, a significant amount of potential production from the Salton Sea. And globally, lithium production capacity continues to expand. The question is, how is all this going to balance out? If we get everything coming on stream at once, like direct lithium extraction from oil field brines, from geothermal brines, expansion of other brine operations, and the addition of clays, is this actually going to mean that in the short term, we're going to have an excess of lithium, which could create challenging economics for individual lithium producers. But in the long term, if we, you know, would we actually have undersupply? What's this balance going to be? And how is this balance of supply and demand going to play itself out? Well, this is just looking, this is a similar diagram to that, uh, um, that uh, uh, Leanne showed earlier. This is just looking at lithium production globally. We've got hard rock brine and mixed production compared with the, the real lithium price norm, uh, normalized for inflation to $1998. We know that uh, this is predominantly from a traditional uh, continental brines and hard rock production 
Uh, there's minimal contribution of clays, geothermal and oil field brines. So the question is, are, are we, is the expected increase in demand going to match this expected increase in supply we're going to see from all of these sources that aren't yet on this graph? We know that some producers have delayed or scrapped plants for lithium production, and we know that it, maybe it's also easier for hard rock producers to ramp up production. If we look at a, a traditional evaporative brine, it takes about two years for that brine to go through the, the process of lithium production. And that means that any brine operators who are starting to ramp up production two years ago may only start to see that lithium increase happen around now. And this is just looking at some of that. I'm not going to go into the details here, but if anybody wants this information, obviously the recording is here. But this just looks at one state alone in the US, Nevada. Obviously, I'm biased coming from there. But the fact is that if you look at the overall total of reserves and resources, you know, we're talking getting on for 118 million tons of contained lithium carbonate, mainly in clays, but there's also some potential brine projects there, as well as the currently producing Silver Peak brine operation, which is going to be doubling production in the near future. This is just one state in the US, a state that has a lot of lithium. There's an awful lot of other lithium likely to come on stream, which may challenge the economics of these brines that we're talking about today and these brine projects. And we need to understand this type of uncertainty, as well as the environmental impact uncertainty that Sophie mentioned in the previous talk. And this is just one example. Uh, again, this is the, the Sparks Gigafactory in Nevada, uh, Tesla Panasonic, has a capacity of 35 gigawatt hours of cell production per year, about half a million Teslas. Uh, if you do some calculations and assume they're producing what's called NMC811 batteries, that just means the cathode in those batteries contains 80% nickel, 10% uh, manganese and 10% cobalt. This factory alone needs about 4,000 tons of lithium, an awful lot of cobalt, nickel, manganese, and graphite. Global nickel production, as an example, and I'll explain why I'm talking about nickel shortly, is estimated in 2023 to be 3.6 million tons. This factory alone consumes about getting close to 1% of global nickel production. And if we go to nickel and more nickel enriched cathodes, you know, the, the, that, uh, that means that these factories are likely con to consume even more nickel. And there's 300 of these either planned, developed, or, or completed underway globally. So this is the kind of demand side of things. But the other thing we need to think about, because we're talking about lithium ion batteries as a driver for lithium demand, it's not just the lithium that comes into play here. It's all the other things that we need to put into these batteries and that will potentially affect lithium demand. If you don't have the nickel or the graphite or you have an excess of these things, then all of a sudden your lithium ion battery demand and your lithium demand may be affected by these other supply chains. So there's a lot of uncertainty to think about here. Uh, we don't know the timescale and effectiveness of direct lithium extraction yet. We talk a lot about clay sources of lithium, sedimentary lithium, but as yet there's not been any successful development of this on an industrial scale. So we wait to see what happens at Thacker Pass and Rylak Ridge and so on. We need to think about the timescales of mining and brine operations. If you look at the IEA data from 2021 and Richard Shoddy's data from Australia, you know, we might go for four years from discovery to extraction for lithium in, in Australia, pegmatites, seven years in South America, but we don't really know about brine operations here, how long they will take to come on stream from going from essentially a discovery to, to production. Environmental, social, governmental challenges are huge for all extractive industries, especially mining. There's other developments at grid scale storage, which could provide opportunities for alternatives to lithium. And we need to think about, again, this balance of supply and demand and price volatility. And that's especially true of lithium. Lithium is a small sector. If we see, look at volatility in larger sectors like nickel, uh, this is just an example of the nickel price over the last uh, two years or so, going from a peak downhill. Why do we care about this? Because nickel is a major part of the lithium ion battery uh, 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 supply chain. And the fact is nickel is currently in oversupply and it's going to be an oversupply to the end of the decade. What does that mean? You actually look around at nickel mining operations. BHP's Nickel West has been written down by two and a half billion dollars. And nickel at current prices means that only 35% of global nickel production is likely to be profitable. We don't know these things for lithium operations yet. We don't know what the break even is for a typical direct lithium extraction operation from a geothermal brine and things like this. This all leads into the uncertainty over the nickel, over the lithium sector. 
So the question is, you know, if, if direct lithium extraction works perfectly, geothermal brines for oil field brines, lithium pipe processing works fine. Are we likely to have an oversupply period, a short term period of oversupply, and then maybe undersupply as the, as the lithium demand overtakes that lithium supply? Pricing impacts are huge. Uh, there's a, a few days ago, uh, Century Lithium's Clayton Valley a direct lithium extraction brine project released a feasibility study using a long-term price of $24,000 for lithium carbonate. The current price is about $15,000, so their shares actually fell as a result of that step towards developing a brine operation. Discovery is one thing, but capital investment, especially for small companies, is a real challenge. And we also need to think about this in a global, uh, on a global basis. We're not the only country producing lithium. We're not the only country looking to produce more lithium. There is a global market for all of this, and we need to think about global production from friendly countries, unfriendly countries, and where our lithium sector is actually going to get this lithium from in the future. We need to understand all of these uncertainties to work out what the likely impacts are on the success or failure of individual lithium projects or parts of the lithium sector. Just kind of wrapping up, the small scale of this sector combined with the timing of supply and demand changes that we still don't really know and, and is affected significantly by policy can lead to significant price volatility. It's unlikely that even offtake agreements is going to reduce this volatility a, a huge amount. Policy developments and changes are huge in this area. We need to consider the interplay between lithium and other metal supply chains as well. And we need to understand changes and uncertainties to ensure that the lithium brine industry is prepared to weather this volatility. Otherwise, projects may fail, and that means in the long term, we may actually end up with undersupply if some of these projects don't make it through some of these volatile phases we're seeing already. We need to think about what is a break-even point of an individual project compared to actual likely lithium prices for salars, continental brines, oil field brines, geothermal brines, and then the impact of hard rock and sedimentary lithium sources coming on stream. And as mentioned earlier, critical metals may not always be critical. There's no problem with a single point of failure here necessarily for lithium, and we know that import reliance can decrease rapidly for some critical metals once we get secure supplies on stream. And one example of that is tellurium, where supply is actually uh, import reliance has decreased from 75% to 25% in one year as a result of developments in that sector. Lithium is a bigger sector than tellurium, but the fact is if we get multiple sources come on at once, that could lead to challenging economics for a number of domestic projects. And that's about it. Uh, I'll happily answer any questions. I know, I know I've thrown a lot of information out there, but the fact is there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the sector that I think we need to understand. Some of these developments are great, but we need to understand whether they're economically viable and what the overall scenario is for the stuff we're talking about today put in a, a global context of the lithium sector. Great, thank you very much, Simon. So we have uh, just time for one or two questions. I'm looking to see if there's um, Yes, please. Gary Goldberg. Simon, great overview, and uh, especially on the overall economics. How does recycling play into this down the road? Because uh, eventually those Teslas got to go in and get a new battery. What happens to the old battery and can they recover that lithium and nickel and all the other elements? Uh, one would hope so. Otherwise, kind of all the lithium we're using is one use only, and then we're really in trouble. But then um, the... I think that there's a number of large developments going on in that area. I mean, we're seeing already recycling kind of uh, facilities tool up using the black mass that's coming off uh, battery production lines. And the other thing is we need to actually think about what type of recycling are we going to do? Are we going to literally recycle, like take one battery and turn it into another battery? Or we're we just going to take batteries out of electric vehicles and use them in a different way? Because if you, say, put them as grid scale storage, then the, the, all of a sudden the cycling of power means that those batteries could actually have an extended life without actually formally having to recycle them. So repurposing rather than recycling could also have a significant role here to play. But I think that there are a number of positive developments, but that's a, a crucial thing in all of this because we can't have this lithium coming out of the ground and being just one use only than being wasted. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on because we have uh, 11 minutes break now and then we'll reconvene um, precisely at 2.30. Thank you again.